Gosh, I forget. Names. I have so many of these. We're good. We're live. Right. We're going. We're actually we're active there, Tommy Buns. Like I feel my phone telling me. Well, speaking of phones, I'll just turn this down. Michael Hurst, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How Welcome. are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing very well. Sorry, this is a bit unprofessional of me, but I just realized my phone's up. So now my phone's <laughs> down. Um, hi. Hi. Welcome to the Department of Conversation. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. This is my second one with a real person in real life since pre lockdown. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. that's good. So they've all been Zoom. They've all been Zoomy Zoom. No, that's ones. interesting. Well, it's, you know, for me, it's like um, when we went into lockdown, we had planned this tour but yep. then it all lockdown happened and it kind of got put on hold and we thought it was going to be not happening then we go to level one and then we're allowed to and the, the, you know the, the tour comes back and so suddenly after lockdown we've had to add more shows in like people really want to see things you yeah. know? and we've been doing record like full houses all the time it's amazing so let's have a look at this time if you want to bring this up on the old uh where is my link there yeah, daily atheist is that what we're talking about daylight, daylight atheist. atheist that's right is what we're talking about that's right um and it's a tom scott show and it seems to be basically <coughs> what like the story this well an imagined story of his father but but using his father as uh, the... uh, it's not that imagined i think oh, okay. i think <coughs> excuse me i think most of it um it's real it's you know i've read his uh, tom's autobiography and you can see that um, his father really was like this. And right. even though he's used other names in this particular script, um, yeah, it's, it's, the stuff really happened to yeah. him. He really was treated that way by his dad. And it's a complicated thing because his dad is like this really brilliant raconteur, funny, uh, life of the party sexy kind of guy who just had no way of relating to his family wow. and was horrendously isolated of his own doing so it's it's hilariously funny and terribly sad <laughs> at the same time because i was thinking I, i've heard from several performers including you just now right. and and uh, michelle a court for mm -hmm. comedy and various people who are all saying a similar thing where uh, they go um the crowds are coming out because because of lockdown they're coming out, they're wanting more, uh, and they're wanting an experience again with people around. Yeah. And 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 what you've just said is you haven't put more shows on. I'm yeah. assuming that's a part of it. People are like just – it's like when the rugby started, all of a sudden there were sellouts for the first few weeks. People just wanted something. I think so. I mean, I guess you've got to factor into it as well. I did another one of these tours two years ago, another Arts on Tour thing, with an, a show that I'd written um, – no holds barred and it went really really well and people and on that one i had a q a afterwards the show was an hour long and then afterwards i had a q a and often the q a would be longer than the show oh really yeah it was amazing they were really and i think i sowed quite a few seeds of because people laughed and they loved the show and they thought it was great so and this one is in in many ways more accessible because it's you recognize the character you recognize the type that he's irish but he's you know um comes out of world war Two. he's living in hunterville or around martin actually all up there and um you just recognize those guys you know who who kind of were a bit destroyed by the war and life right. afterwards and never really got to grips with it you know it seems to be um a subject matter that doesn't have a lot of laughs but i guess tom scott Oh, it's brings it out and, and when, when you got i remember my my parents telling me the story my mother in particular because my mother's maiden name was mulligan right so i literally could have been patty mulligan right. you know, there's a lot of you can good. see you can see in this the irish you yeah, know okay? yeah absolutely L literally comes out the pause but they tell the story of their wedding day well she did yeah it's funny, I told the story at her funeral and my dad went, I never knew that. It's what they don't know after 60 or 70 years. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, and that, you know, they went to dad's parents' place the day after the wedding or whatever and it was all, you know, pinkies out and that sort of thing. Yeah. They went to mum's bog Irish family in Newmarket living opposite the prison and it's literal dancing on the table. So it yeah. seems it's a part of the culture, isn't oh, it? Oh yeah, it's definitely there. And you, you get that feeling, the gift of the gab and all that stuff. Yeah. But then this, you know, he came to New Zealand in 19... 46 or something like that and actually it's not it's the story of that acclimatizing to that and it's the story of meeting as well it's a story of a lot of people story of my parents i mean one of the things that tom and i both uh, agreed on is that we had similar fathers mine wasn't quite as 
self-alienating as him, but um, the funniness, you know, the funny jokes. But at the same time, these guys got married because they, you know, the first time they had sex, they got pregnant and they're married and that's your life choice. That yeah. is it, man. <laughs> and also it's like back then you're tied down to it. You know, you can see it. No counseling available, nothing mm. like that. You just did it. And so all that um, unhappiness and uncertainty and unfulfilled qualities just got, um, you just said to, well, that's all, just put it under the carpet. That's it. So, of course, that does affect your psyche. And um, you see it in the show. I mean, I'm painting it as a, it's a really funny show. Yeah. I mean, it's that's the whole point. It's appalling at times. You're laughing and you think, why am I laughing at this? These, But he's really funny. Um, and yeah, so, and I think people are really, yeah, they're really enjoying it. One of the things I was wondering, and you've kind of already answered it, is um, how you've got this out so quickly. But it was ready to go pre-lockdown and so, it just, just slid in afterwards? Well, well I, I, I did it as a bigger production for the Auckland Theatre Company um, in 2019. So about 18 months ago, I think I did it, um, at their big theatre up there. And it was... A simple production, it requires simplicity, but it had, you know, um, quite a few lighting bells and whistles. But as I was doing it, I was thinking, man, you could do this in a pub. You could do right. it anywhere. And I'm on a bit of a jag at the moment of getting it out to people. So I, I was able to say to um, Steve, the guy from Arts on Tour, that look, I've got the show, and if we reduced it to, you know, a um, an even simpler setup... Mm -hmm we can put it anywhere. My rule with these shows is it doesn't matter where we go, there's no problem. We're going to be able to make the show happen. So, as I say, I've done it in pubs and I've done it tomorrow. We go to an opera house in Oamaru, so mm -hmm. we've got that going on. Um, it's just a matter of tromboning the set and yeah. tailoring the performance. And I love it, the discipline, the, the way you kind of uh, adjust um, it's part of the deal. And that's how we got it out so quickly because literally all of it fits in a van. Right. The whole thing. All the lights, if we need our own lights, often theatres have lights, yep. but all the set, all the props, everything fits in the back of a van. It's pretty cool. It's you a just, pretty it's, cool way to do honestly, it. Honestly, you turn up and we can, my set goes in, in under an hour, we can have the whole thing set up. Wow. Just the two of us. And then, same thing taking it down like 40 minutes 30 minutes we get packed up and we move on drive off go to the accommodation next day we get up drive to the next town 34 towns I'm going to so yeah I was going to say you said basically five straight weeks almost it's every day on. Yeah, yeah. so five seven thirty five so that's, yeah, that's yeah, almost yeah 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 it's um it's a bit longer than that we're going to um, so we started in Stewart Island which was fantastic oh, that, you're lucky going Barakiura, yeah it was great and that was my first um real time with an audience in this incarnation. So I've changed, although we did the show 18 months ago, we've adapted it, changed it slightly. Not not the lines, but mm -hmm. changed the shape of it, you know. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, and so then we're just basically zigzagging. We've been, last the last time, the day before yesterday, we were in Hawia in this tiny little hall. And then, you know, been Alexandra and um, Cromwell, um, Arrowtown. We're going to... Uh, places like Fairley, You're right, Geraldine, nice. North Island, uh, Twizel. Yeah. North Island, we're going to Northwood and all these tiny places. It's fantastic. I've been to a few of them before and they they, they come out. You know, They yep. want to see these things. And um, um, are you travelling at all with your wife or is your wife visiting you at all during the travels? Oh, or? God, no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, she's... Jennifer's... You know, we, we have very busy... Um, we're both busy. Yeah. And... Um, She's seen the show. See, uh, no, she she um, she's off doing her own thing. She's yeah, got right. you know, lots of um, film work and stuff like that. So no, I'm literally taking this time out. I'm doing this because, look, I I, I spend most of my year directing television programs, yep. you know, um, dramas like West Side or Eight Hundred Words or you know American things sometimes Spartacus. I just did Mystic, which is a BBC thing. So I, I do a lot of that. And but what I love doing most is standing on stage performing. So if I honour that, I have to make sure I can do that. So um, taking out six weeks to do a tour, I just block it out and say, I'm going to do it. 
Yeah. And then I commit to it and then I can do it. And I get the, all this experience on stage. It's fantastic. And I guess winning New Zealand Row of the Year, she can't really complain because she must be, <laughs> able, she must be you must be able to use that against her quite often. Hang on, New Zealand Row of the Year wouldn't 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 act like this. No, surely. Not, no, well she is. She's the queen of New Zealand in some ways. I just <laughs> I just um no, that was amazing. She so deserves it. I mean, you know, for what she's doing, especially in the whole two things, the world of um Te Reo Maori, the the way she's championing um that court that thing uh and also she's uh, into this whole new thing which is intimacy coordination on films and tv yeah so so up until recently you know um if you do a, a fight scene in a tv or film you get a coordinator and a stunt coordinator who teaches you how to do the things how to be safe and um and all of that but when you do sex scenes, intimate scenes, it's like, okay, off you go. Get on well, to No, sorry, this can't, this is a real uh. problem. Because, especially now in the climate that we all know about from, since Me Too and yeah, all of yeah. this, there's no way that you can ask, especially women who are often more vulnerable in these situations, you just have to be, be it's crazy to just say, right, off you go. I mean, how do you, so, intimacy coordination is like, um, what the stunt coordinator is to fight scenes is yeah. that. And so ways of really making it non-threatening, powerful, because it's not just about saying, ooh, you've all got to be safe. That's crucial. Yeah, of course. But more, when people are in that safe zone, what happens is more powerful because mm. it's, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, oh, just take all your clothes off. It doesn't have to be anything like that, you know. And so, Intimacy coordination is now a big deal, and in fact, you you can't really do any scenes like that now without one. And so neither should you. Does she? Is it? I'm thinking about who she works with. So the stunt the stunt coordinator would work primarily with the actors and the direction. No, of she the director. works with the actors. So she works with the actors. Yeah, she. What? Okay, director. What is your scene? What do you see? How do you want it to be? Yeah. Oh, I see this, and I see this, and this. Okay. Now we go to the actors and we say, this is the director's vision. And yep. then we start looking at how, mm. how, how, how can this be achieved? Yep. How, what are the safe zones? It's really breaking it down in a way that they don't feel awkward with the director. Yeah, yeah. The director doesn't feel awkward going, oh, well, I want you to put your hand there yeah. or do this. <laughs> yeah. um, and they work it out. Now, I, I've done a lot of incredibly um, sensual scenes, like with Spartacus. It was full of them, you know. Now, for me, it was always, um, I, I was fine with it, but it was always like a, right, okay, we all have to put on our big grown-up hats now and start talking through. And I was always of the opinion that you, you lay out exactly what you want, mm -hmm. then you work out what is possible, yeah, and then the director sticks to it. And so I would say, right, well, this shot, you might see, I might say it's, it gets really boring. Like this shot, we're going to see uh, your left flank up to the left breast and then we might see you work out exactly what that is they agree or modified or whatever and then you write it down and sign it wow so that people don't get so because the worst yeah. thing that can happen is for a director to walk in to a scene like this with say a, a guy and a girl or two whatever it is and then suddenly start going um oh can you try this can you, why don't you, why don't you, why don't you bite her ear or whatever? Well, no, sorry, we didn't agree to that. How can that be? That's not safe practice. And so, um, and I've had to deal with people like that. I've had wow. to, as a supervising director, sometimes I've had to go, look, you can't do that. You can't suddenly invent a whole bunch of stuff. So, yeah. So it sounds like, um, like a good fight director would lay it out well and yeah. give you the best. Yeah, best product. Do you feel comfortable doing this? It yeah. would do that, but also on some level, if you're writing it down and signing it, there's some protections for the people making it as well that you're not going to have something further down the line saying, "Exactly, I, I did something I didn't want to do. I felt forced into it." But also, they've signed it, yeah, so I, I, yeah. I'm protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm totally protected because yeah. I go, and they're protected because I won't be doing anything else. And I just show them all the shots, and I say, "Oh, look, this bit here, that bit where we." you're getting up and we caught a bit more than we thought that's not I'm, i'll cut that yep. you know you do all of that and so um yeah that's a it's a big it's a it's a big movement now and is it a different world making a television film after me too in particular than it was before I, I think it's changed a lot yeah i know from my experience um 
that if we are doing anything, even if it's just uh, uh, they kiss each other, yeah, you've got to actually address it and say, do we need anything around this? Um, any meetings that I have with people on that sort of thing has to have um, other people in the meeting, all of that stuff. So, and, you know... Um, it's all great practice with the thing mystic you know a lot of the actors were under 16 so i had to have police checks background checks all of that so it's very very it's good it's great because i think in the end actors and actresses get empowered by being safe and being yeah. able to do it so i talk about my own experience in that way i'm terrible at public speaking i'm i, I can sort of do it but too much standing in front of crowds being me I just fucking hate it. I hate it. I just get <laughs> embarrassed and I don't know why. I just do. But give me a script. Yeah. I'll go anywhere. I right. have no qualms and no fear as long oh. as I'm behind it, you know, make it work. And that's the empowerment, you know. If it's if it's sitting there and I feel powerful, mm -hmm. empowered, if you like, then they're going to get a good performance. So that mask, that the role you're playing, the mask you're wearing for that almost, you can step outside mm -hmm. yourself and do and be things that you're too shy or embarrassed to do in your real life it's just the whole thing about um um yeah i'm not a very a lot of actors are like this i'm not particularly a public person like right you know and um i used to do it i used to think oh well i'm an actor so i should be able to go debating and yeah, yeah, yeah. public speaking and and comparing you know running people's events no forget it i do it or oh, i did it and i was getting so hit up about it that i just went ah why am I putting myself through this, you know? So I stopped and my life is much better because actually opening nights doesn't matter how many years and I've been acting since I was 18. It doesn't matter how many years, opening nights and then really any performance, you get nerves. Mm. I mean, I'm already living that. I don't need any more. So, yeah. Whereas Jennifer is brilliant at all that stuff. Right. <laughs> different skills here. Well, that's great, isn't it? Nice well, union with some different skills. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we've been together for since 1983 so wow it's amazing yeah so we and we really like each other's work which is important because two actors you know but we're quite different we've had the same we have the same work ethic um she directs uh and does a lot of more musical stuff than i do mm -hmm. i direct and do tv and stuff which she doesn't do so we kind of you know we round out quite well <laughs> You mentioned uh, West Side, yeah, and I was going to say um, we have a the three of us right have a connection. Who's that? The three of us, yeah, have oh, a connection yes. with West Side as well, because Tommy did some work on West Side. Didn't That's you, right, did some work on that. Yeah, and, and if you have a look at the screen here, or the screen up here, Tom, this one here with the TVs on it. Oh yeah, I um, if we bring that up on the um on the computer oh, yeah. there, Tom. I I was working. Uh, running a couple of sites that was doing some of that TV buyback when we moved away from CRTs. Oh, yeah. I found all these vintage TVs. Wow. I kept them, and the set director from Westworld, uh, Westside, so I just bought, went... bought them, and those are the ones that I sold to them that you guys used on Fantastic. Westside. Yeah. So these are the TVs that I provided to your <laughs> oh, there we go. It's a great show, Westside. I loved working on it. I couldn't do the last season because um, I had another job, but oh, I had some great... It seems that I looked at the um, the IMDb uh, for it today, mm. um, and it seems that people joke about Lord of the Rings. Oh, it's every single New Zealander in Lord of the Rings. It seems West Side, when you think about actors and people who are in that thing, yeah. actually almost did. Uh, did like yeah. it had. If you look at the list of, I know. of actors that are in there, I know. it's like everyone. Every actor that yeah. New Zealand has produced at some stage was on yeah. Westside, even more so than any of those other yeah, probably. ones we joke yeah. about. Well, there's a, there are big stories, you know, lots of incidental characters, a big group of central characters. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah. Um, and, and also they had that lovely thing of being able to get people who had been in um, Outrageous Fortune yep. who were playing characters of bringing them in as the grandfather of the character that they'd already created. So there's a bit of that lovely stuff going on. And we always used to joke as we got closer and closer to the 90s, because this all started in the 70s through the 80s, you know, uh, they were getting closer and closer to when Outrageous Fortune needed to start being, yeah. you know. So they had to stop somewhere. I said, 
let's go into a parallel universe. Or was, and, it, was there ever a conversation of a crossover somehow? Could that be possible? I guess with different characters. No, because no, because the, the, they're all the parents yeah, of the people. No, yeah, you couldn't yeah. cross it over. But you could go into a parallel universe. That's what I thought. Bring the aliens in and then suddenly you've got a whole new series. <laughs> but uh, no, it didn't fly. <laughs> I, used to, I used to watch uh, The Walking Dead. Oh, yeah. And then they brought out a series before it, which was Fear the Walking Dead, yeah. which was like three years earlier mm. explaining the whole how the zombie yeah. came to, and yeah. they ended up I don't watch it anymore because it all became the same after a while but they ended up doing crossover and one from one show started yeah. appearing on the other show yeah. and they caught up to them yeah so yeah, yeah. Um, so once you've finished this run of, of shows on mm -hmm. stage mm -hmm. what happens with you what's your life um, I go back to Auckland they've we've added eight performances of this uh, in Auckland they just because um, of course you know with um COVID-19 and everything the theatres want to open but there's no there are no shows yeah. because it's nobody's coming over here so they're quite desperate for content and of course I can just helicopter my show in because literally I can drive up in a van and there it is four mm. lights mm. Um, two lighting cues on and off <laughs> and that's it um, and some sound cues but um, so we're doing those extra performances and then I start prep for well uh, this show Mystic that I was doing, we, uh, I started doing my block, which is the final five episodes, but then we had to stop. Yeah. So now we're picking that up again, um, bringing in the two leads from England, uh, and then through September I get to do that, prep it then or re-prep it and shoot it, and then I'm going to go on to do some Power Rangers. So oh, cool. I get to do about. Oh, I don't know about eight episodes of that. So that's through basically till the end of mid March, I think. I've got a um, production. I'm going to. It's probably not official yet, but I've got a production with the Auckland Theatre Company coming up. I hope, uh, and also, um, well, not I hope. I've got the part. I just can't really tell you yet, um, <laughs> uh, and because um, they haven't announced it. Uh, also, um, oh, I've got another couple of shows uh, An Iliad which I've been doing with Shane Carpenter you know from down yep. here Carter rather Shane P. Carter um, we have been asked to do that quite a lot that's a huge effort so they want me to do that the Readers and Writers Festival so there's a lot coming up you know I mean I never know more than six months in advance you know you always you know when you do that Power Ranger type thing does that feel like it's a bit of a throwback to Hercules you know that's that uh. some kind of not quite, because I mean, I think Power Rangers is a bit more kind of cartoony yeah. than that was. But that's that kind of. Well, I learned to direct on Hercules. I learned to. Right. Well, I, I was already. You got to remember when I started Hercules, I was already thirty-seven. I wasn't like a young one. I'd already had a have a, well, I had a good career going, mm -hmm. and I did a lot of directing of theatre and um, a lot of big Shakespeare's and all of that. And the thing you learn when you're directing plays is how to move actors around, mm -hmm. uh, blocking and. Um, so and then when I went to did Hercules, um, that was amazing. That was like eight years of just amazingness and fun and just ah incredible. And and um, I remember that I said one day, um, I think I could do that, direct it. And I went to the boss. There we are. Yes, there's my love interest. And, then, <laughs> and I went uh, okay. Um, can I do that? He went, yeah, sure. And they gave me this episode. Oh, my God. It was like the early days of CGI, and they right. gave me the... It was like uh, they threw me the hospital pass, really. I had to do creatures that um, porpoised through the sand in this desert world, desert area. They were a cross between sort of stingrays and cockroaches. Wow. And we had to... It was a, it was a re, it was a re, it was sort of like based on that movie Tremor, you know, the things under the ground. Yep. So if you weren't on solid rock, they yep. would eat you. Right. So um, I had to do this whole. I'd never even done any of that stuff. So when I got this, I went, "Holy shit!" And I, <laughs> and I had to learn. And I learnt on that single episode, my first ever episode. I learnt like unbelievable amount of stuff because all these guys who knew what they were doing and trying to help me out and everything. And uh, in the end, I made an episode that rated really well cool so then they gave me all these others and so that was um yeah that was a time i i just you know and we got to play with so many things um 
huge cameras, 35 mil cameras. Sometimes you'd have three or four or cranes. It weren't just like the cranes we have now with um, you know, hotheads on them and cameras that are remote controlled. You'd have two guys on the end of wow. the crane sitting, all of that. And we still made fast turnaround television. Like So learning how to pack all that in, how to organize a day, how to move big lots of equipment, how to move people around. Yeah. And um, so when you say is directing a bit like that, it is actually all like that because those skills that I've picked up, um, I put into West Side or Power Rangers, all of it, and I know how to move things mm -hmm. quickly because I've learned to do it on that big machine, not just little cameras, a big machine. I mean, because we had the money, I remember doing a sequence where we had a a barge that we'd reclad yep. to make it look like a Roman galley. Okay. So it's a real wow, barge. That's money. And then we had to clad another barge to so we can have the one Roman ship ram the other Roman ship. Right. So how are we going to do that? So we went up to Long Bay and we got the barge that we'd we're going to have rammed, we sort of built it on another barge and we put it kind of off the water so we could actually have somewhere to put the gear and stuff. And then we got this other barge and we weakened that we did the whole thing, you know, building the rails so the barge came. But it was at night because we wanted it to be at night because I wanted it to be at night. <laughs> so, all right, we'll do it at night. Okay. Oh, and we want rain. So we literally had a hundred action players, like various levels of stunt world. The barge comes crashing in. We had, out beyond it, we had these two big rafts, pontoons, with giant lights on stands wow. to, to be able to give us the moonlight. Then we had rain towers on rafts, all pouring rain. And I had a crane over the top. I did one shot where we went from the back of this galley. The camera swooped down, went over like that, and then to the bottom of the steps, into the bowels of the ship, bottom of the big steps up to where Xena is standing at the top and comes up and ended up on her. Uh, one huge shot with all the stunt players, action, all took us hours to rehearse it so that as the camera's going up the stairs, there are people rolling past the camera and all that sort of stuff until finally there's Xena, Warrior Princess. The amazing stuff. Took us three days to shoot the sequence. Wow. Three nights, I should say. But when you're doing that, you can do anything. You can do absolutely anything. And it was the most expensive scene ever made on Hercules. Uh, I'm not sure it was, actually, because there was another one <laughs> that I did. And I didn't even know if that was where we had... Right, we're going to do... Um, we're going we're gonna to have a, a meteorite <laughs> landing. So we'd rigged that up on a wire, and it was really just a... We painted in a, most of it later, but we had the explosion where it hit, which yep. was a, a cart in a big ancient sort of castle-y thing. We had two stunt guys next to that who were on these, we call them ratchets, so they could be, there were these huge wire rigs that were off camera. The guy, because the idea was when Hercules punches someone, he's so strong, he should be able to punch someone so they go flying over the roof, you know. And we'd always have to do it in two shots because yep. you couldn't. So they invented this harness where the stunt guy, he could go boof, and the stunt guy could go flying like, 30 meters away wow. and land on a site specific point on a roof and roll off it we could do all those so i had those so the meteorite explodes the guys blow way over there like that and it bursts into flames and it was raining and it was night because <laughs> i just thought it looked really more dramatic <laughs> was that are those kinds of budgets still around i mean was that was that like because they talk about like the 90s as a golden age for sitcom for example yeah yeah and the money being thrown around sitcoms yeah. you never see it well you'll see it again but nothing like it was with the series Maybe. of sitcoms well is, is it is tv still like as no, expensive tight, as no, that it's tight 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 everybody's looking for the the quickest leanest cheapest that's just the way that's what producers do they know how to spend money properly mm. but they know that they've got to be always mindful of what they're spending, unless they're doing stupid things. Oh no, you hear about um, multi-billion, multi-million dollar productions where the director goes, oh, I don't want it there, I want it over there. And it's like $30,000 worth of move. So people do that, but not on television. Back then, uh, remember at one point, the New Zealand dollar was 47 American cents or something like that. Wow. So they had a lot, oops, sorry about that. They had a lot of money and, and they were working with the American studio uh, ethic, if you like. So when they came here, 
they bought, they rented, when Hercules and Xena were running at full throttle, there were something like six or seven sometimes big warehouse factory things that have all been converted into studios. Then out in um, Sturgis Road, out West Auckland, West Auckland yeah. they uh, leased this huge piece of land. First thing they did, put roads in. Um, wow. And the roads would go to concrete pads dotted all over this piece of land. And then coming off the concrete pads, they would build all the sets. And there were like four or five different villages, castles. Um, they dammed a creek to make a lake. They built um, this huge mound of earth. I can't even describe it, like a big U-shaped mound of earth with another mound in the middle. So you had a, basically a U-shaped canyon, which was, you know, 30 feet high easily. Wow. And it was really, you know. And then the quad bikes could drive up on top of it to carry lights and stuff because all quad bikes and stuff. So they had, they had plenty of money at that stage. I don't know what it cost per episode, but they had a lot of money. It seems, I mean, it's so surprising. I'm not surprising as in, People who are like me who don't think about this sort of thing mm. just don't think about it. But yep. that is a sounds like a mammoth undertaking. Mammoth. And millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, and you think about making movies and you think about people who make you know, a fifty million dollar movie. I mean, that I mean, because it lasted five or six series, whatever it was, that's easily gonna be oh, ten, yeah. tens of millions of dollars. Oh yeah, they production. made a lot of money on it. Oh yeah. I mean the trick then, of course, television's different now, then it was um syndication. Yeah. Or um or the big networks, and this, these were syndicated shows, and so they would be selling to different parts of the states and be shown at different times. Blah blah blah. Now, the rule was, so we made we made five movies before we made the TV series. Oh, is that right? Yeah, there was there were four originally. Um, I was in the first one, and then they liked what I did and what Kevin did together. They made a fifth movie, which was the two of us, a bit like you know buddies together that was the prototype for the series i guess then they said right we're going to make some episodes so we made i think 13 episodes now 13 was a number that when you're going to go for a series you make 13 episodes yeah and for syndication and on the strength of that if they go well if they rate well they might order another uh, bunch until you've got to 22 because 22 hours of television mm -hmm. is sellable um, overseas. Um, it's it's if you had it, you know, on Thursday morning at nine o'clock every week. It's 22 weeks. It's a good number of television. Yeah. So it's a magic number. So if you make 22 episodes, the chances are you're going to go and make more. In which the next thing is well, the only way to really do it so that it's valuable for the company is to make 66 so yeah, the right. next number is 66 right. so we ended up going well we're going to go there so that's when we all went oh wow this is going to go on for a while so 66 episodes well then after that that's a lot of television to sell yeah and then it keeps going well we made 120 episodes and uh, you know that's a lot of television hours so i would say universal made hundreds of millions of dollars out of it it's an amazing, and then now you look at how TV is going this day and age. Probably one of the platforms, be it Netflix or Disney or yeah, or, or whatever Lightbox, whatever there is out there, Amazon Prime is probably carrying them. Oh yes, in, in uh, places of the world. Oh yeah, yeah. I still get fan mail from, you know, Georgia, USSR, um, 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 Ukraine, South America, and some of them, I guess they know that I'm not. It's twenty years old. Yeah, because they go, you know, I'm liking you. I'm thinking you are a good actor, and I'm thinking, do you know what I look like now as opposed to what I looked like then? You know, there's all this sort of because they don't, you know, really. Well, this well, is this this video we found actually it goes to show that the strength of the program because this is Looper, who was actually done a it was a couple of years ago. All right, what the cast of Hercules, Hercules look like today? Ah, and you have to be a pretty big show. Yeah, for a group like oh, the I didn't Looper. even know you'd. I didn't know that. Existed. No, see, so you're in there, and the thing that we thought was funniest about it, so it's got yourself there, and then it's got some imagery of you um, there. Oh, yeah, yeah. But then the thing that was funniest is we had this shot, and Tom goes, "It's me." So, <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. So there's little Tom sitting right yeah. there as well. So again, a connection between you guys. Where and the hell was that? That was Tom. You can answer. Was, where was that? That was the. Wasn't that the actors' program? 
Michael? Ah, it was. That, it that was. crazy short film. That film, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, I was directing, wasn't I? So we were just looking yeah. for some. I was looking for some film of Hercules. Came across this, and as we're flicking through it, Tom goes, "That's me." So there's yeah. so Tom right there. I've had um, <laughs> I've had lots of different looks, you know, um, over the years. That's the Serbian prisoner look, isn't it? That's, yes, my son's <laughs> like that. He's my son's just been in, all over that part of the world. He's come back looking like a, a Serbian <laughs> used car dealer or drug dealer. He's got a white tracksuit, shiny top, and no hair and bling. I'm thinking, <laughs> Jesus, oh, Jack. <laughs> yeah. I, I love your son, Michael Hurt. Yes, Jack's great. I he's say, a, I love he's, Jack. He's a good boy. So, um, yeah, look, fun times. I mean, I mean, I learned so much, and, and I'm eternally grateful to um, the producers, especially Rob Tappett and Eric Grinderman, who are these two guys who just gave me this chance. And then, you know, got some great Eric skips. Everybody's worried about film in those days. Cause yeah. You only can, you know, cost money, film. It's not like digital. And, oh, God, we're going to... And he, I'd be told, you know, you've got to watch your film ratio. And then Eric, the producer, would go, just keep shooting. Whatever, <laughs> just keep shooting. And so we'd do that. And I think I held the record for the most amount of film shot in one day, which was something like 16,000 feet of film. It's a lot. And for those of us uninitiated, what would be a regular day? Oh, well, I mean, it depends. But film, you know... 800 maybe a thousand feet or wow like that. okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's a lot it's a lot <laughs> or maybe it's no maybe it's 8,000 feet I'd shot 16,000 whatever it is yeah it stood as a record for ages and then we went on with that group of people you know um, Renaissance with Rob Tappert and all that we you know I then was before long I was doing directing Spartacus which was phenomenal and that was about just going back to your money question I think they had Something like five or six million dollars an episode. Wow! Now West Side gets made for six million dollars, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a different, you know. But nevertheless, you, I say that it doesn't make the job any easier or any mm. difficult because it's always the same. There's never enough of everything. It's always that's the truth. And it's economies of scale, isn't it? I remember I've used yeah, this example several is. times that I used to work for a radio station that was basically a charitable trust, mm -hmm. and there'd be complaints from the announcers, "Oh, we can't even find a hundred bucks for a competition." And then I moved to what was then Classic Hits, and there was complaints from the announcers, "Oh, we can't even find five thousand dollars for a competition." It's the same complaints. Oh yeah, it's the same. Just how, the economies of scale well, change. How, how's the schedule? How long is it? And mm. I go, well, it's as long as a piece of string, isn't it? Really, and every single day pretty much you'll get to a certain point in the day you look at it and you go we've got two hours left but we have to shoot four hours worth of material right how does that work well that's when you pull your tricks out and just go for it and that's when it becomes the real job of directing but the real job of directing i'll be honest with you is and i've done this a couple of times so we're doing shots the director of photography, me, we make, you know, oh, this angle here, and I'm always into, you know, foregrounds, and, you know, we make beautiful pictures, and mm -hmm. we all love that, you know. But really, the DP could make the beautiful picture. Right. I don't actually have to make the beautiful picture. I just, the directors have their vision, right? Um, the lighting, you know, all of that stuff uh, is specialised, but there comes a point where um, the director has to, yes, block the things and do all that, but it's when you get to this point where there's no more time in the day mm -hmm. and you have to make a decision to go into overtime. So 15 minutes overtime, it's a very expensive thing to do. Time is money. On um, on Spartacus, an hour's overtime was something like $70,000. That's how much it costs. For all the staff and yeah, wow. To keep them for an hour. In it. So when you're making these decisions as a director, you've got to, tell your assistant director ask the producers because you've got to ask them we're going to need you know my point is that normally you get to that point you're coming to the last 20 minutes and the assistant director's going got to get moving so you yeah. go okay i can make that work right good we'll have that just do it bring the camera over here quickly five minutes you know you're going up but if the actor doesn't get the performance at the same rate as we're working it's a trick you know you end up with the last shot and this actor has now got the pressure of being the last shot mm. feeling the crew racing to get it shot before the um, time's up but that actor might not come up with the performance that the director wants and that's where the director only the director that's when and I've had that where it's coming to this point and I've gone oh shit here we go I'm going to need to do this again and potentially three more times because mm -hmm. this person's not 
getting it or whatever. And the first assistant director's there going, come on, we've got to hurry up. And I go, shush, we're going to go again. But we'll go into overtime. Well, we're going to go into overtime because the producers will not be happy if they're if the performance is terrible. I mean, that's where they will, I say to them, they'll thank me. 15 minutes overtime versus coming back to reshoot the scene. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when the real directing, to me anyway, that's when it's about the actors and the director and the performance. It sounds like more, it sounds like when you talk about the AD, you talk about people who can set the lights and set the scene. No, that's, that's technical, whereas the director is more personal. It's more people managing yeah, than, yeah. than logistical well, managing. Getting performances yeah. out of, and, and helping actors who are lost. Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of actors complain that a lot of directors just go, you know, oh, slow it down a bit or make it. Speed it up a bit or whatever. Whereas, yeah, I'm an actor first. So. How do you feel about? I, I've heard stories about people like Woody, um, Woody Allen, who almost doesn't give direction. He just kind of goes, just do what you want, and just lets them go. How do you feel about that? Well, sort a lot of, of actors turn up. I mean, I I feel that um, when you're directing, you you expect the actors to turn up um, with their A game. That's what you do. I know you can act. Mm -hmm. That's why you're here. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to teach you to act. So let's go. Um, sometimes you get inexperienced actors and you have to help them, and that's fine. But um, in some cases, say with West Side, seeing as um, it's in my memory, um, those actors are so brilliant. You know, I'd go in and I'd go, well, okay, uh, the scenes here, I kind of feel you should come in through there because we've got a camera down here. It's a really nice angle. And... There'll be dialogue in the middle. And I think there might be a move, I don't know, around the middle of the scene or somewhere. See if you can see if you can find that. Off you go. That's my direction. <laughs> and then they do that. And the move, would that be a good place to move? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I'm usually quite actor friendly. So that's fairly level. The But once you've done that, it's up to them. So in some senses, you've got to be able to say to actors, yeah, do it. You know the character you bring it you you know um i wouldn't be comfortable just going ah oh, just do whatever you like and we'll follow you with the cameras because yeah. i like the structure i think structure gives you freedom once you've got a structure you can do whatever you like i was going to say before and i then i didn't say i think oh maybe that doesn't sound quite right i was thinking like a, a manager for a football team and almost does sound like you you've just spoken again i'm thinking about a manager for a rugby team a coach mm. you can you know talk to them but basically when the players are on the field they they got to perform. They got to yeah. They, they they have the skill set. That's right. They know their job. That's they right. got to do it. That's and at right. half time, the coach might go, "It's a bit of a you know, little five minute tweak yeah, yeah, here." Yeah, yeah, but yeah. the players got to do the. They got to. They, they got to It's do up it. to them. No one else. And it's different in theatre, of course. It's more like that in theatre because right. you once you've directed it, you kind of opening night comes. You can't do anything about it. You just got to. Whereas with film, you can say, "Okay, hang on a minute," you know. And also with film and TV, you have the editing process, which yeah, is true. fantastic. And so I've often, you know, things have to go so quickly that you go, well, hmm, okay, I've got the other take. I can use that shot. I can, okay, that's it. We don't have to do any more because editing in your head to make sure you know what you've got because right. time is money. And it's a terrible thing. You know, a lot of um, people think, well, directors should have the time to do whatever they like, but we all know what happens when that happens. The thing never gets done. It goes over budget, whatever. So I'm a big believer in schedules. Mm -hmm. And I think that trying to achieve the day and and pull out the tricks to make sure that you can do it in the day and have to do that's as creative a challenge as the actual doing over. And if you spend the time going, oh, God, this bloody day, we're never going to get it. Well, look at that. As soon as you go in like that, it's over. Forget it. I go in in the morning and go, right, shot number one. Okay, we're all behind. We're in the dumper, Okay. And they all go, what? I say, right, let's move on. Because you got to understand on film, from the first shot, you are behind. There's no question. Right. You are behind. <laughs> and if we all agree, then we'll all be happy. You know, we don't have any problem that getting behind because we're behind. Come on, everybody. Let's go. We're behind. It's fun. You know, I make it fun. As, a, as someone who's been around in this mm -hmm. game for a long time, you know, um, well-respected, you know, uh, director that a lot of people would look to and look up to and stuff. Mm. How do you feel about the successes of Taika Waititi over the last sort of oh, two, three, four years? Amazing. I mean, he's, you know, he's got a gift, Taika. He's, um, you know, he's really uh, clear and, you know, and there's a bit of, uh, yeah, I mean, he's been well promoted and he's, he's good. I mean, he's great. And there's uh, certainly been fortunate. And of course now 
he'll take a whole lot of people with him. Um, and suddenly, I mean, look at it, you know, this whole New Zealand thing that's exploding mm. on, the, on the world, you know, and um, <clears throat> that, um, you know, Ragnarok was awesome, that film. You know, it, it changed sort of the, that kind of superhero amazing. movie. And so genre. funny, you know. Yeah. You know. So I think there's, you know, that he, that, you know, the um, uh, Flight of the Concords and right back to the front lawn, there's a, a, a sort of a streak of self-effacing, simple... New Zealand the humor which undercuts anything grand mm -hmm. you know and I think that's a beautiful sensibility and he's got that in space plus I mean clearly he I mean I often think about that wow if suddenly you're doing a Marvel major movie and then all these other movies it, it, it he's adapted to it like that mm. you know so and you know he's smart you couldn't really say he's painted himself into a corner of, oh God, of, no. of themes, could you, when you look at no, from no, no. Jojo Rabbit to Thor to... Yeah, no, he's the know. opposite. He will do whatever he wants to do, and it's great. Yeah, he's, you know... And there's a few other, you know, Carl Urban and a few other actors you go over and you go, well, wow, that's really great that they've, you know, done that. And so, of course, they'll all come back here now <laughs> because of the, cause we're the only country. I'm touring a show around yeah, the country. I know. How many people are doing that in the world at the I moment? I know. You know? Quite funny. That was my um, that was my watch ringing. I apologise about that. <laughs> That's all right. That's a strange thing in this day and age, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, yeah, and and this whole kind of COVID world we're living in, I I have to, I have to double take often actually where I go, like because I I follow a lot of politics and watch a lot of international yeah. news, and I look to the White House and I look to a press conference and all this all the journalists are wearing masks and I go oh shit that's right yeah. there's that thing that's out there that that's right that we're not in fact, I had Rob Fife as a podcast this morning mm. and he was involved with the economic recovery group mm. and um, yeah just it's, I, I forget we forget and then I have a meeting with uh, the head of the Dunedin Fringe Festival last week and I start talking about last year's Fringe Festival and it wasn't last year's Fringe Festival it was one three months ago that got cancelled but it feels that long ago yeah. that, that we were going through it it's going to be interesting you know the Auckland Festival which um, is coming up in March and a lot of the well a lot of it was cancelled this year I saw some things uh, my friend Shona McCullough is she's uh, the artistic director and um Interestingly, we'd already been talking about the sort of the problem of having to bring so many acts over from overseas on those planes. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be socially responsible and responsible for the planet, here we are, fucking plane loads of people. And we were going, what would it look like if we didn't do that? What would it look like if we only had a few acts from overseas? What mm -hmm. would that be like? And then we both sort of had a bit of a revelation and said, actually, it would be amazing because all the resource would go into the local industry. Yeah. And if that can be built up over years, then that standard of excellence will be lifted and people will understand that we do amazing things as much as anybody else. So we thought that was a good idea. And then suddenly, here comes... Um, COVID-19 and that's what's going to happen next year there's going to be no people coming from overseas Yeah, who's going to come Yeah, and so the festival uh, is being reshaped into this absolutely you know really well supported festival of creative people from the region thankfully so finally we might get some traction into you know and it means that those people who might miss out because they might be on, I don't know, I'm not talking about levels as in quality, but they might be the third step down yeah. because the big one resource <coughs> from overseas is no longer there, then mm. they get a shot to come out and perform. And yeah, I, yeah. I think it's exciting as well. I think it's <coughs> with support, it's, it's the support thing. You know, yeah. There's lots of people wanting to do shows, lots of people with good ideas, but being able to actually say, hey, here's how we can help you mm. make this. And then then to the key to it is to say, right, okay, that's happened. The following year to do it again and say, here's something, develop your work because so much work at the moment in New Zealand gets invented yep. and then vanishes. You never see it again. So step one, next year's Fringe just, Festival. Yeah, just and it, there, there's several of them. In fact, I, I think it goes, there's something like Adelaide, then Auckland, then Wellington, then Dunedin. Yeah. I think that's the path. Yeah, and I think all of those festivals are interested in sharing. I'm not sure about the Australian one at the moment, but Certainly, the the uh, New Zealand festivals are all hooked in. So, 
Yeah, I, I think it could be great. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But it's going to be a, a, a look. You look at Broadway. Oh my God, it's dead. It's gone. West End. You know, they're not. They can't do anything. Some yeah. of those theatres are losing so much money they will never come back. You think? Yeah. Never, it's serious, ever. man. Wow. It's it's big. It's big time. You know. I, I think that that's part of the part of. I mean, I I, I don't know about the budgetary necessities right. for a theatre A, but B, I think the other thing is. I think I have been folded, uh, fold, no such word, lulled into a false sense of security mm. around the COVID situation. Yeah, because be we're here. Because we're in New Zealand. I know. I'm, yeah. Look, I say, I'm going into these um, these um, venues and they're tiny and there's crowds of people and everybody's happy and no one's stressed because there's no, there's no, nothing is. So we're having a great time. I've got friends in London, who've friends in America who've been um, in New York, who've been... Um, on lockdown for like you know 15 weeks they're yeah. just really yeah yeah look i think i it's it's, it's an it's an, when i say amazing i mean unbelievable not amazing mm. isn't good mm. but it's unbelievable the weird amazing yeah. crazy time we're living in oh yeah it's biblical times yeah not, i mean i don't believe in the bible but what i'm saying is <laughs> yeah, I if i did it would be like for fuck's sake look at the it comes like, the locusts like end of the world you know trump i, I just i don't even want to go there you know it's, every time i talk about it i just go oh god i can't even believe the awful sycophantic the shameful behavior that's gone on the way he has turned the american the office of president into a shambolic name calling childish useless thing i just can't even it's shameful they should be ashamed i think they're only the big concern at the moment is i feel a little bit the same in new zealand as well I'm really interested to see if Labour can get over the 50% mark. As much as for anything, a bit of a sociological experiment that mm. if a party had 50 plus plus one percent in in MMP, what would that look like? Um, yep. But the but the problem with that is all these people who are saying nice things about the Democrats in America and about Labour in New Zealand, who are normally maybe swing voters, yeah. when they get into that booth and have to pull the arm for yeah, the D yeah, or yeah, for yeah, the yeah, or for yeah. the L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't I just don't feel like America's gonna be quite the walkover that they're all saying it's going to be at the moment when it oh, comes no, to the poll. No, it's not gonna be and even if it, even if even if Trump is defeated, boy. Yeah, that's gonna be another whole shit's gonna hit the fan. That's what I Hey, think. you mentioned Broadway and I yeah. wanted to get your take on something yeah. because it's dominating my house at the moment and I wonder other people's houses if it is too and that's Hamilton on Disney mm. and the uh, and the show that they've put out there my kids at the moment honestly yeah. it's like I have to ask them to stop singing because yeah. it's just constant Hamilton yeah. songs yeah. Hamilton Hamilton yeah. Yeah. the cool thing is that they've learned a lot about the American history because yeah. of it and that yeah. and uh, I'm interested have, have you seen the video have you seen it in real life is it uh, no I've not, seen it in, I've not seen it in real life um I've seen a bit of the video, and no, it doesn't interest me. I'm sorry. Really? How come? No, because I don't like the music. It's not the not your style. No. Are you more? Are, are you not into musicals at all? Or oh, I love musicals. Right. I just don't like that for some reason. Oh, I don't know why. It just irritates me. So, um, and I know all about Alexander Hamilton. I yeah, know yeah. all of that. I mean, I've I've done American history and everything. But no, it's not something that. Nah, I, I don't get grabbed by it. I'm not a I'm not a fan of hip hop or any of that stuff. I've yep. not really. I've never been a fan of any pop music, really. I'm not that person. I, I didn't, I didn't listen to things. I mean, there are songs that I know, but if you ask me, like, forget who's popular at the moment, I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> you know? And you ask me, I, I don't know anything about that stuff because my taste in music is to do with. Um, I like some classical music. I like uh, Brian Eno, like ambient music, um, and music to do with shows that I've done. So over the years, I've, and so if I'm going to do a show and it's got particular music, then I really get into it. Yeah. So it's all specific because my main th relaxation is reading. I don't listen to music. I don't. I can't just have music on. I think it's irritating. I don't understand how people can talk and have music on. I just go, "What are you doing?" I'm I just. It's just the way I am. You must be a nightmare to go to a cafe with. I fucking hate it. <laughs> I do. I, no, I, I'm. I'm all right. Um, but I. I. Just when it's like people having a telly on and nobody's watching it. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. for God's sake, turn the telly off. Let's have a conversation. No, I'm just, I know it sounds weird, but so no, Hamilton, well, not your cup of tea. Take it or leave it. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting part of it that um, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet yeah. had the modern 
dress, attire, yeah. and the classical language, yeah. whereas this has got the classical attire and the modern language. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting kind yeah. of flip on. Oh, no, I like that idea. Done. I'm yeah. just not a fan of the music. Um, <laughs> and yes, Baz, I mean, I do, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet and all of those things, we've been doing that for years, mm. modern dress things. I mean, it's important, Shakespeare and modern dress, because when you think about it, the actors in Shakespeare's day standing up there were wearing the same kinds of clothes as the audience. Totally. They, Shakespeare is to be thought of as a contemporary artist, not an ancient artist. That's the way to look at it. And then you'll see that he just got, the plays just are amazing. They stand up. Yeah. You well, they, they say that there was language of the street. It wasn't even highbrow language of no. the day the Shakespeare. Well, some of it language. was, but, the, but he was pretty clever at, at um, catering to everybody. So, I mean, for example, there's um, a line, you know, in, in a Shakespeare in the Globe, down in the pit, the groundlings, you know, all the poor people, and up around the circle, people who paid more money. So these were generally the well-to-do people mm -hmm. who were much more interested in clever language uh, than the groundlings, right? So um, because of all the clever things that were coming into English at that time, all the um, words from um, uh, uh, Latin and French, they're all being, you know, and Shakespeare coining words. So in Macbeth, there's a line where Macbeth is looking at his hands, which are covered in blood, and he says this line, he says, he asks the question, will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. And then he says this, this my hand would rather, and he looks at the clever people who will know this, the multitudinous seas incarnadine. And looks down at the making the green one red. You're right. <laughs> In other words, I'll do this for you. Yeah. And you just so that you get it. And you think about that. Wow. What a smart thing. And let's look at it. Multitudinous seas in Carnadine. Two words. A whole iambic pentameter line. Multitudes are crowds of people. Um, multitudinous seas. How does that work as mm. an image? You know what it is. Mm. But really, the words aren't actually pet, but you nevertheless go wow and then in carnadine he's made this up it's it, he's made it into a verb and it means to turn something red right so he's made that up mm. and it's one just two words in one line the multitudinous seas in carnadine and in case you didn't understand making the green one red anglo-saxon monosyllables thank you very much <laughs> so you know genius i always used to think um mm. When he invented a word or a phrase, mm -hmm. and I think I think he invented from a uh, I'm in a pickle. Yeah, I, I always wondered when you saw that for the first time oh, sitting yeah. there, did you understand what he was talking I about? I think they would have gone ooh ah. Uh, really? That. Yeah, I think because if you've never heard it before, I know what it means. You know what it means. Tom yes. knows what it means. But if you've never heard it before, yes. But remember, Elizabethans spent more time listening than we do. They listened in a different way because there was no television, no radio, none right. of that, and even only a few wealthy people had portraits so visually it wasn't so hot um so they would listen because that was so those plays are being put on on saturday afternoon mm -hmm. these shakespeare plays and there's storms night time all of that how do you know because he tells you you know like in macbeth again you know light thickens and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood so he's painting a picture for the audience who are in the daylight, but they're listening with such intensity that they get the picture right. way more than we do now. Yeah, right. And so when he would do some smart, amazing piece of language, I pretty much think they would be like, oh, wow, I never heard. You know, that was the thing. You know, These days, to shut people up in a theater, you have to turn the lights out. Right. That's what happens. You think about it. Yeah, you turn the light, interesting. Like high school kids, turn the light, they'll go, shh, 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 like smarty asses, you know. And it's like, I want to say, yeah, I've never heard that before. But anyway, <laughs> but when the lights go down, everybody shuts up. Now the job is to keep them interested for the rest. It's easy as anything to get their attention. But if you don't turn the lights out, if you just do, like one of my problems with the pop-up globe was always that marvellous environment and all the rest, and for certain plays and ways of working yeah but the problem was that when it got to the serious plays and the great soliloquies of hamlet or the, whatever in those bits where an elizabethan audience would have gone and listened in the modern audience because there were no lights and everything that, that's when they went and bought their beer which was available mm. in the ground and i just went oh my god you know everybody's 
walking around buying their beer while they get on with the long boring bit but when there was all you know drop your pants and show your bum and stab someone and there's blood everybody's going yay and I'm going well hang on a minute this is not really right so lots of laughs for that so I went and saw Julius Caesar you know lots of laughs and I kept going this is a tragedy mm. I don't understand why mm. you're all laughing at this stuff because you're laughing at the special effect well you know so that's not Shakespeare to me you're like it sounds like you're to put a word to you, it sounds like you're more of a purist. I'm not a purist. I'm nowhere near a Shakespeare purist. I'll do anything. I've I've had Shakespeare. I set the Merchant of Venice in the Hollywood Film Studios in 1929 and made Shylock the producer because where does the money come for films in Hollywood? From the Jewish community. I made it problematic for the audience. Um, I opened the the play and, of course, Merchant of Venice, everybody goes, ooh, how are you going to do Shylock and the Jewish question? I opened the play with... The cast who were making the film in mm -hmm. the studio, which the set was, watching the dailies, the rushes. So the audience, our audience, saw all the actors watching a projected image on a screen, sitting around having drinks like after work. And the images I got from Cecil B. DeMille's King of Kings of Jesus being crucified. So here's a play which is fully charged with... Um, Jewish Christian politics, and the and everybody's going. Oh, and the first thing I showed them was the, Jesus being crucified. I feel like confronting him. I was. I was saying, listen, pay fucking attention. Yeah. Sorry, I don't. But you know, I don't. I don't. I'm not a purist at all. I am pure about the language. Yeah, the I guess language that's what I was kind of thinking. But what I uh, what I get annoyed at is that um, that suddenly because it's the globe and it's a recreation at last we've got Shakespeare no no we've yeah, got right. Shakespeare as he was 400 years ago and actually not as good because our actors don't do it the same way and the audiences don't listen the same way Shakespeare is genius because you can do it now and it still flies because it still flies but you need we're 400 years we have we love lights yeah. we love <laughs> that stuff I'm not saying you have special effects and everything I don't all the time shut it down so people will focus so it sounds like you're saying rather than the purist as in uh, performing it in a pure way that uh, the words can stand on their own without the flashbang entertaining the crowd at the same time um, don't turn it into a pantomime yeah right Hamlet the pantomime is not the Hamlet I want to see behind you yeah <laughs> sort of it's just when they it's just yeah it's just you know it's because they, they're insecure about the audience keeping them interested. And so suddenly there are all these jokes that aren't even in the script. Yeah. Because and if you're relying on that, extra slapstick, extra jokes, extra... Well, what, that's... Mm, I don't know. Not being purist, it's just... I think you're avoiding the issues is what I think is going on. Well, yeah. Michael Hurst, it's time to get you off to your show mm. tonight. Wow, that went quick. Yeah, man, this is like a time time warp in here. Like it a, is, like man. A, we should get you out the door so you can go. Before, yep. before you go, if people want to find out more about your current uh, your current performances and where and when they're going to be, what yep. should they do? Um, go to um, the um, Arts on Tour website and it will be there. If you even look up um, Daylight Atheist Michael Hurst Arts on Tour, just Google that. And all of the, here it is, yeah, all of the stuff is there. Um, so we're on Event Finder right now. So if you, just, if you also put in their Event Finder, and yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. all there and you've got a written think, list down the side. Yeah, we're going in up. Oamaru tomorrow and then I think we go all over the place. <laughs> Can't wait, actually. Hokitika, Takaka. Nice. <laughs> Twizel. Yes. Thank you for coming in. You're so welcome. Thank it, you. It's been a blast. Good. Good.